we have in front of us, three ways he goes about this deception. First of all, the Bible says he calls down fire from heaven. Notice verse 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Remember now, he's a counterfeiter. He's a mimic. All he does is try to do what God does. How many of you know that on occasions God used fire? When Sodom and Gomorrah were judged, the Bible says they were consumed by fire from heaven. There were a couple of people in the Old Testament named Nadab and Abihu, and they were careless in the offerings of the temple and the tabernacle, and they were consumed by fire from God. So here is the Antichrist. He wants everybody to think he's the God. He's got to come up with a fire thing. It is a deceitful attempt to give an air of legitimacy to his presence. I got to tell you, as I study this book over and over again for all these years, one of the things that just overwhelms me is the incredible illustration and power of deceit. And I'm reminded that even in our culture today, that's the one thing that we are most vulnerable to. How easy it is for us to be deceived. Nothing seems real. Everything is sort of outside the pale of reality. And even in our churches and in our walk with the Lord, if we're not careful, we deceive ourselves. Over and over again in Scripture, it tells us to look out for ourselves, let we not be deceived. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Satan has three things that he does. He deceives, he divides, and he destroys. And his number one tool, his entry into the life of a person tool, is the tool of deceit. And when you see Satan at his pinnacle in the tribulation period, what you see is the deceiver at his best. He calls down fire from heaven. And then second, the Bible tells us that he commands that an image be built. Verse 14 says this, And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Once again, the image of the beast marks the final stage of apostasy and idolatry that has always characterized false religion. Stop for a moment and try to imagine with me this moment. If you've been to Israel or if you've read Israel's story in the Bible or you've read books about the tabernacle and the temple, and you've heard me preach, especially from the book of Revelation, you know that in the temple, the most sacred place in all of the temple was the Holy of Holies. The picture is that people could come to the outer court. Sometimes they could come to the inner court for sacrifices. But only once a year was the high priest of Israel allowed to go into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifice for the people. And it was such a holy place that they put bells on the robe of the high priest so they could hear him when he was walking in there to make sure he was still alive. They tied a rope around his waist in case he did something wrong in there and he was immediately stricken and they could pull his body out from having to go in and get him. The Holy of Holies was the most sacred place on the earth for followers of the true God. And on this particular day, Satan's Antichrist and false prophet have an idol established in the Holy of Holies and require the people of Israel and all those who gather on that day to fall down before that idol and worship him. The image of the beast is evidently what the Lord Jesus meant when he said this in his Sermon on the Mount. When you see the abomination of desolation, that's what this is. When the statue is put in the Holy of Holies, that's the abomination of desolation. Notice what Jesus said, when you see that, spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. Have you ever heard the statement, the cup of iniquity is full? (laughs) This is the moment when the cup of iniquity of this whole world is full. I don't want to put Jesus or God into a vernacular of the contemporary. But I have to tell you, I think I hear God say, that's it. I've had enough. And at that moment, all hell breaks loose on this earth as the second half of the tribulation begins to unfold. 
Paul wrote about this to the Thessalonians in his letter. He said, let no man deceive you by any means. There's that word deceive again. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. The devil himself has tried to take over the place that belonged only to God. And remember, this has always been his desire. When he was kicked out of heaven and when Jesus was on this earth, remember he took him up to a mountain and he showed him the whole area and he said, Lord, Jesus, if you'll bow down before me and worship me, I'll give you all of this. Satan's great desire was to take the place of God and be worshipped. And finally, he requires it by this terrible act of blasphemy and desecration. And then, thirdly, he not only commands the image to be built, but he causes it to speak. It says in verse 15, And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now you can argue about what this is all you want to. All I can tell you is it seems to me that this is nothing more nor less than demonic possession. I don't know of any other place in the Bible where an inanimate object is filled with Satan, but here it appears to be that the devil fills this beast and allows this beast to counterfeit the miracles of God. Then notice number four, his program. And this is something with which most of us are somewhat familiar. The false prophet causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The false prophet is going to wear two hats during the tribulation. He'll be the religious leader and the financial czar. He's the one who will actually put into process the numbering. Now, everybody wants to know what the mark of the beast is. And I wonder if by the time that happens, the only place on the human body where it could be put that is, doesn't have a tattoo on it will be on the forehead, you know? I'm not sure. <laughs> I know if you know, I've just noticed over my lifetime a lot more tattoos going on than I ever saw before. Well, this won't be a tattoo, but the Bible says there's going to be a mark. Without this mark, no one will be able to buy or sell. No one will be exempt from this. Whether you're a CEO or a hired hand, no one will be able to function without this mark or this license or this insignia. No one will be able to shop at the mall. No one will be able to eat at a restaurant. No one will be able to fill up. a gas station or pay utility bills or buy groceries or get prescriptions filled or pay to get the lawn mowed or pay the mortgage without the mark it's the tribulation trademark and without it you won't be able to function so what will happen is people will go bankrupt and they'll starve if they don't take the mark of the beast they will not be able to function and somebody says, well, what does the mark look like and what does it mean? Well, look with me again at verse 18 where we get a bit of a clue. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. Now, that's the number you call the phone company and tell them you don't want in your phone number. Could you please change my phone number? Or you call the DMV and say, you put this on my license plate, I want to turn it in for a new one. Nobody wants 66. We don't even know for sure what it means, many of us. We just know it's not something good. Well, what is it? What is significant about 666? Oh, I'll tell you what, if you read the literature that I read on this, it would just amuse you so much. I've read so many. If you want somebody to be the Antichrist, you can make it happen. Here's what you do. You give every letter in the alphabet a numerical value, and then you start adding up their letters, and if you add them right, you can get to 666. If it doesn't work the first time, include his middle name. <laughs> if it still doesn't work but it's close, give him a doctor's degree. And keep working on it until if you want to, you can make anybody the Antichrist. And you've probably heard all the stories about Hitler and John F. Kennedy who was shot, and you've heard them all. 
But the bottom line is, folks, we don't know who the Antichrist is except what the Word of God tells us. It says it is the number of a man. Think with me about that for a moment because here is the conclusion of this message. Man was created on the sixth day. They are to work six days, not seven. You couldn't be a Hebrew slave for more than six years. Six is the number of a man. Now, God's number, on the other hand, is seven. He created seven days in a week. There are seven colors in the visible spectrum. There are seven notes on the musical scale. There are seven feasts of Jehovah, seven sayings of Jesus from the cross, seven secrets in the kingdom parables. At the fall of Jericho, seven priests marched in front of the army bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns. On the seventh day, they marched around the city seven times. That's all good, but what about the book of Revelation? Well, that's where it really becomes interesting. Remember, the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it says at the top of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So listen to me. In the book of Revelation, the number seven is used more than 50 times to describe things that are going on in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'm going to read a bunch of them to you. Listen to this. There are seven churches, seven spirits, seven candlesticks, seven stars, seven lamps, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven vials, seven mountains, seven kings, seven beatitudes, seven years of judgment, seven letters to the seven churches, seven I am statements of Christ, and seven songs in heaven. And that's just some of them. Seven is God's number. Seven is the number of completeness. We have seven days in the week. But six is the number of man. That's what the Bible says. It's the number of humanity and the number of incompleteness. And perhaps the meaning of 666 is that human beings, even to the triple, fall short of God's perfection. On our own, we are incomplete, and we long for fulfillment in the perfect completeness of God. Everyone in this room today is either a six or a seven. And I want to tell you right now, I'm going to take all doubt away. I'm a seven. And I'm not a seven because I'm any better than anybody else. I'm a seven because I have accepted God's gift of Christ's righteousness, and that's how I got to be a seven. If you try to get to heaven by being the best six you can, even if you triple it, it's going to fall short. Six is the number of incompleteness. Seven is the number of fulfillment. I want to tell you a story that will help you remember this. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a great illustrator of another generation, explains this in a story that he tells. He said the children of the great composer Bach found that the easiest method of awaking their father was to play a few lines of music and leave off the last note. <laughs> they said that the musician would get up immediately, go to the piano, and strike the final chord. <laughs> Barnhouse said he tried it. He said, I got up early one morning, and I went to the piano in our home, and I played the well-known carol, Silent Night, and purposely stopped before playing the last note. And I walked out into the hallway to see what would happen. He said, my eight-year-old son had stopped reading his book and was trying to find the note on his harmonica. He said, another child was singing the last note lustily, as loud as he could. And an adult from upstairs called down, did you do that on purpose? What is the matter with you? You see, our very nature cries out for completeness, doesn't it? Our very nature wants a resolution. The Bible puts it this way, that we're created with eternity in our hearts. And until God is at home in our hearts, we're always feeling like there's something missing. Some of you here today, you're going through that right now. You're good people. You're good sixes. You might even be a triple six. <laughs> but a triple six is not enough. You have to come to Christ and get his righteousness and become a seven. Because if you don't become a seven, there's a little limerick you can keep. If I'm not a seven, I can't go to heaven. That's the truth. Only a seven gets into heaven. And you're never going to be a seven on your own. 
You say, well, I'm going to try to be my very best, and if I work really hard, maybe I can be 666 and a half. No good. The only thing that will get you into heaven is the perfect righteousness and completeness of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And the wonderful news, men and women, is this, that God had made it possible for all of us to go from being a six to being a seven by just putting our trust in Jesus Christ. That's why the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. If you trust in him, he will come and live within you, and he will become for you what you can never become for yourself. You can either believe it or not believe it, but you can't deny it. And one day you'll stand before the Lord God, and he will take account of who you are. And if you're still trying to be the best six you could ever be, the Lord God will look at you, and if you're not a seven in his son, Jesus Christ, you will not get into heaven. I hope that you'll put your trust in him today if you haven't done so already. Almighty God loves you. Oh, I can't tell you how much he loves you. Do you think he would give his son to be your savior if he didn't love you a lot? And he wants you to know him. In just a few moments, Dr. Jeremiah uncovers the prophetic truth of the beast from the sea the mysterious character found in the book of Revelation, an agent of the apocalypse. Discover the identity of all 10 of these crucial figures in Dr. David Jeremiah's best-selling book, Agents of the Apocalypse, a riveting look at the key players of the end times. Grab a front row seat to the cataclysmic clash of heaven and earth and witness the mysteries of Revelation unfold. Come face to face with these agents of the end times, some who have lived, some who will live, and some who could be living today. Order your copy of Agents of the Apocalypse today when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And if your gift totals $60 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will thank you for your support by sending you the Agents of the Apocalypse study set. You will receive the Agents of the Apocalypse book, Dr. Jeremiah's current teaching series on 10 CDs or DVDs, a correlating study guide, and the Revelation prophecy chart. Order Agents of the Apocalypse, a riveting look at the key players of the end times for a gift of any amount, or the Agents of the Apocalypse study set for a gift of $60 or more. Contact Turning Point today. Thank you for watching Agents of the Apocalypse here on Turning Point. In appreciation of your viewership, Dr. Jeremiah would like to send you the Revelation Prophecy Chart absolutely free. Contact Turning Point today. And now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message, The Beast from the Sea. When the Antichrist ascends on the global stage, the world will be waiting to receive him. Hard to believe? Not really. For even now, if we had someone on the stage waiting to walk out and solve all of the issues that are going on in the war-torn nations of the world, if that person had a workable solution, do you think we would listen? Sure we would. So would everybody. And one day when things are way, way worse than they are today, such a person called the Antichrist will appear. First of all, we are told about his preparation. In Daniel chapter 8, we read these words. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king will arise having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes, his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. At the beginning of this period of tribulation, an ominous personality will arise. Inconspicuously at first, the Bible says he comes up from among the masses. Revelation 13, 1 says, I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. In the book of Revelation, wherever you see the word sea, S-E-A, it usually is not in reference to bodies of water, but rather large groups of human beings. That's where we get the term the sea of humanity. When you see that word in the book of Revelation, it's a reference to the sea of humanity. So this Antichrist arises out of the sea of humanity that is alive during this period of time. 
his preparation. Notice also his presentation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read this about the Antichrist. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin, which is another name for the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that, now listen carefully, he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so till he's taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Now, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonian churches, he gave us some important information. He said that the seven-year tribulation period during which the Antichrist will be revealed cannot happen until there is a falling away. It is only after the rapture, during the tribulation, that there is a great revival because of the two witnesses and the 144,000. Now, I would just stop for a moment and tell you that there is surely some evidence that this falling away is at least in its beginning stages. All of the statistics I read from George Barna and the other researchers tell me that we are barely holding our own as evangelicals. In his Olivet Discourse, Jesus talked about this. Here's what he said. Then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another and many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawless will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now the Bible also says that before this event called the tribulation can happen and the rapture which precedes it, there's one other thing that has to take place. The Bible says that the Antichrist cannot come until the restrainer is removed. That's what it says in the Thessalonian passage we read a few moments ago. Now who is the restrainer? Well, the restrainer is none other than the Holy Spirit. He's the one who lives within each of us. The Bible says one day the restrainer is going to be removed. When will that happen? Well, when we leave, the restrainer leaves because he lives in us. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit will be taken from this earth when the rapture of the church occurs, when the restrainer is removed and the lawlessness and apostasy happens then this one called the Antichrist will be revealed. Could the Antichrist be alive somewhere today? Absolutely. Because he's not going to be revealed as a child. He's going to be revealed as a grown-up. And uh, since we believe the rapture could happen at any time, and if immediately after the rapture the Antichrist is revealed, he could be growing up someplace right now, probably in Europe, and in his preparation for that moment when he will walk out on the stage. Now, what is this guy like? What is the Antichrist like? Well, the Bible, while I've said, doesn't tell us who he is. It tells us a lot about him. First of all, his personality. Revelation 13, 5, if you still have your Bibles open there or look on the screen, we are told that he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Daniel says that he will be boastful and will speak pompous words against the Most High. Now, take all of those phrases and put them all together and shake them up, and what comes out is the Antichrist is going to be an impressive orator, an incredibly gifted speaker. The Bible tells us also that he will be very attractive. Daniel says in Daniel 7.20 that his appearance was greater than his fellows. In other words, he was impressive. Have you ever been in the presence of an impressive person? You just walk into their presence and, you know, something happens. They walk into a room and everything changes. I believe he will be extraordinarily handsome. I think he's probably going to be very tall. The Bible says he's also going to be a man of great intellect. Daniel describes him as somebody who understands sinister schemes and through his cunning shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. This is going to be some kind of an impressive guy. We wonder how in the world such a thing could happen, but it will, and he will be just what this old, sinful, God-rejecting world will be looking for, someone to make the pain go away and give them some hope. Now, he has a plan. 
His plan is, according to Daniel, to come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Very perceptive terms. The Antichrist will begin as one of many minor political leaders, tracked very little attention at first, but gradually grasping more and more power. His plan is to defeat all of the other world leaders and eventually take over the world through whatever means is necessary, first by deceit and intrigue and later by force. And he will be very prideful. The Bible tells us that he opens his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. Once he has the ear of the people and they begin to talk about all of the missing folks who are gone to heaven, the Antichrist will take the opportunity to blast heaven with his words. Not only blasting God, but blasting his law and his love and his plan and his family and his son. He will just pour out his wrath against the God of heaven. That's what the Bible says. Now he will use his cunning to form a peace treaty. Daniel 9.27 says he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Let me just tell you that in the book of Daniel, the word week here is a week of years, not a week of days. This is a week of years, seven years. The Antichrist will come to the people in Israel surrounded by their Islamic enemies and say, I can fix this. If you will trust me, I will make a peace treaty with you to protect you from all of the enemies around you. This is a seven-year treaty. Because of the treaty, Israel will once again feel like they can relax. Unfortunately, they will let down their military readiness. They will turn all of their energy into building up their cultural improvements. They will refurbish and rebuild the Jewish temple. But the Bible says halfway through the seven-year treaty, Daniel 9.27 says it this way, in the middle of the week, if a week is seven years, how long is the middle of the week? Three and a half. He will bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abomination be the one who makes desolate. In other words, right in the middle of the tribulation when Israel has let down its guard, the Antichrist will come in and he will go into the temple as we'll see in a few moments. He will defile the temple and he will cause the Israelis no longer to be allowed to worship. He will cause sacrifice and offerings to cease. And then in verse 7 we are told about his persecution. It was granted to the Antichrist to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe and tongue and nation. Remember, we talked about how he gained control over them through his licensing approach. When the peace treaty with Israel is broken, all hell will break loose on this earth. And this will usher in the last half of the tribulation, normally referred to as the Great Tribulation. Daniel describes it this way, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. And in 824 he said, He shall destroy fearfully, shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and all the holy people. The Bible tells us that at this particular time, everything on this earth will be as bad as you can ever imagine. Massive beheadings will be nothing compared to the torture and persecution and the hateful conduct of these emissaries of Satan. And how do they do this? The Bible tells us about his power. In 2 Thessalonians 2.9 we are told, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Powers, signs, and wonders are all words which we ascribe to Jesus. But here we are told these are powers, signs, and lying wonders. In other words, they're not really wonders. They just appear to be. They're deceitful wonders. The Antichrist deception will be so sweeping that people will be unable to believe the truth. Then the Antichrist will enact his most sensational feat. It will appear that he has been killed. And then to the astonishment of the whole world, he will be raised back to life by the power of Satan in a grotesque counterfeit of the resurrection. Revelation 13.3 says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. 
and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Please notice the careful wording of the scripture. It does not say, I saw one of his heads mortally wounded. It says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. So he deceives the world into believing that he has been killed and then comes back to life. Satan is the great deceiver, but I want to tell you something. He cannot create life. He cannot create anything new. So this is not a genuine resurrection. It is a faked resurrection. And the Antichrist is so profane. The Bible tells us in verse 4 of Revelation, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? When the Antichrist breaks his treaty with Israel, he will surround Jerusalem with his troops. He will seize the newly constructed temple. And then, as one last mockery of God, Satan will install the Antichrist as a god in the temple of Israel. At that point, we are told, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the false prophet, his associate, will erect an animated image of the Antichrist in the Jewish temple and enable this animated image to speak. He will command the world to worship the image, ultimately fulfilling Daniel's prophecy. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, says Mark, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I don't know if you're getting this picture, but this one, this Antichrist, will orchestrate the things of the world until ultimately he is placed in the throne room of the Jewish temple and the whole world is required to bow down to him and worship him as if he were the true God of the universe. And those who refuse will be executed. Now that's the story in so many words that is a tutorial on the Antichrist. What's going to happen during the tribulation when one man rules the world? So what happens to this guy? How does it all end? What is a deserving ending for someone who deceives the whole world into such evil? What should become of him? Well, his punishment, according to Daniel 8.25, is defeat, total and absolute defeat. At the end of the tribulation period, with all of his armies gathered, he is told that the army of Christ is in heaven and on his way to the earth. And he assembles all of his armies together to fight against Jesus Christ and the second coming. We're told Christ is riding on a white horse and all of us who are followers of Christ with the angels will be observing this event. Now what does Jesus do to defeat this evil man? Well, Daniel says, he shall rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without any human means. That's a clear statement that no humanity is going to be involved in the destruction of the Antichrist. He's coming against Jesus with his armies. Here comes Jesus on his white horse. And John tells us what happens. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And when the beast comes face to face with Christ, he will meet a swift end. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and with the brightness of his coming. Do you know how hard it's going to be for the Lord Jesus Christ to deal with the Antichrist? Watch this. That's it. Now, he is destroyed, he is defeated, but he is not dead. Revelation 19, 20, the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And the two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Did you know that the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist are going to be the two first inhabitants in the lake of fire? 
You say, well, don't people go to hell now if they don't believe in God? They go to Hades or to Sheol. One day, the Bible says, death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire, but not until later. But right now, in the lake of fire, there is an awaiting for this moment when at the end of this time we've talked about today, the beast, Antichrist, and the false prophet will be cast into the lake of fire forever. Now, fast forward 1,000 years. 1,000 years after their incarceration in the lake of fire, we are now at the end of the millennium, the kingdom time. The beast and the false prophet will still be alive and in torment. Here's what we read in Revelation 20.10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the Bible says that all those who ultimately reject Christ will one day join them in this place of torment. Now, guys, I got to tell you, a lot of people are okay until I get to this point. But don't be telling me about this place called hell where people are going to be tormented forever and ever. And I don't like the brimstone and fire thing either. So just don't go there. Well, I'm not going to tell you anything that I don't know from the Scripture. And I know what the Bible says about hell. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Here's what I can tell you after all my research about this. Here's what I can tell you about this place. Are you ready? You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. And you don't have to go there. The only way you can do that is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. By saying, Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the Savior of the world and I want you to be my Savior. And I invite you into my heart and I ask you to forgive my sin and I confess that you are my Savior. When you make that decision, you get on the invite list to go up to heaven when Jesus comes back. Dr. Jeremiah will return with one more inspirational word to close today's program right after this. It's obvious that this issue and how we respond to it is vital. On today's program, Dr. Jeremiah uncovers how our steadfast faith applies to this subject. From discovering prophetic clues in Scripture to finding the power of Christ in all of us. The gospel of God is the same everywhere. If you have to change it, it's not the gospel. So you can preach the gospel. You might have to do it through an interpreter. But when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether they're Hispanic or Arabic or Filipino or Chinese or Korean, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And these people come to Christ. And now, join Dr. David Jeremiah as he addresses an urgent issue for our time, the bleeding of our borders. I believe that immigration is one of the most important and yet at the same time, one of the most difficult issues of our day. I am not naive enough to think that I can resolve this controversy in one short message. But it is my hope that I might bring some biblical clarity to help us as followers of Christ to know what to do. Our nation's attitude toward immigrants is eloquently expressed in the words that are engraved on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty which you can see uh, from this city if you desire. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. America has historically been proud of this history of openness to outsiders. But today, many factors have triggered a change in the thinking of people and a growing concern. So before we consider some of the problems that we face because of immigration, I want to give you the other side of the story. I want to tell you about some of the great things that happen because we are a nation that welcomes those from other places. 
Immigrants enhance American culture by bringing new perspectives and experiences into it. Multiculturalism, according to some, increases tolerance for differences and adds variety to our cultural experience. We love our choices between Mexican, Italian, German, Chinese, or Thai cuisines. In fact, last night I had chicken parmesan in an Italian restaurant here in New York. We celebrate a lot of holidays here like St. Patrick's Day and Cinco de Mayo and Yom Kippur and Ramadan and the Chinese New Year and other observances that are brought here by immigrants. Did you know that 75% of those who migrate to this country profess to be Christians when they come across the border? And that's actually 5% higher than the number of American residents who live here. And the faith of many of these immigrants reveals an amazing intensity and sincerity that will compound their effect on America's faith. I know this for a fact. Because on occasion, I'm asked to preach to our Hispanic congregation through an interpreter. And I'm always so blessed to be in their worship service, even though I don't understand the lyrics. I can sense the love they have for the Lord God. So there's a lot of wonderful things that are happening in America because of all the differences in the peoples that come. We live in a cosmopolitan world. We shouldn't be upset about that. We should rejoice that God has given us that privilege. The potential of immigration is incredible. But let's be honest. This is a series of talks about reality, talks about truth. And not everything about immigration is easy. Not everything about it is positive in the lives of some of us. Working against the immigration advantages are several growing and unsolved problems, and nobody seems to know what to do with them. First of all, there's problems with legal immigration. The flood of immigration in the past few decades is a major contributor to increasingly high unemployment in the United States. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in May of 2016, the real unemployment rate, which includes discouraged workers no longer looking for jobs, was 9.7%. Another problem that we're facing in our culture today is the failure of some of the ethnic groups who come into our country to integrate into American life. Throughout most of our nation's history, immigrants adopted the language, the laws, and the common customs of the host nation. The term melting pot was a descriptive metaphor indicating that the potentially divisive attitudes and customs of the old country would be left behind as the newcomers blended into a new commonality of purpose. But today, it seems that the pot is no longer melting. Some incoming groups defy cultural assimilation. They cluster into enclaves and demand special concessions for their ethnic customs, their beliefs, their languages, and in some cases, even their laws. That's just some problems with legal immigration. That's been in place for a long time. As long as I can remember, it's been legal to come here and file for citizenship and go through the process and become American citizens. I've actually gone to some celebrations in San Diego where people have officially become citizens of the USA, and it's a joyous, happy moment, and we party when that happens. But if there are problems with legal immigration, just think of the problems with illegal immigration. According to combined studies conducted by three U.S. government departments, immigrants entering the United States illegally are responsible for an extremely high number of crimes. Another rising problem that we're dealing with regarding illegal immigration is its effect on the social and governmental services which are provided to all Americans. I remember when I read this, I had to go back and make sure that I was reading the truth because it's so stark. Listen to this little story. In Dallas, Texas, the Parkland Hospital offers the second largest maternity service in the United States. In one recent year, 16,000 babies were born at the Parkland Hospital. And 70% of them were to illegal immigrants at a cost of $70.7 .7 million. And one of the most disturbing aspects of illegal immigration is simply the fact that it's illegal. 
Somebody said the first thing that a person does who comes in here illegally to this country is break the law. The Apostle Paul was quite emphatic in the New Testament, commanding Christians to obey the government's laws. He explained that God ordained government to keep order and protect citizens. Our national, state, and local governments all have on the books laws that prohibit non-citizens from crossing our borders and living in our communities without proper qualification and legal documentation. Today, those laws are ignored, usually in the name of compassion. The fact that so many in the United States not only tolerate this, but encourage and defend a practice that works outside of the framework of the law should trouble all of us. It is true that without borders, you don't have a country because the people who live within the country are supposed to make the laws that determine who else can live in this country. And we're going all the way away from that in this current climate. So those are just some of the issues that we face. And I'm not here to tell you I've got the answers to all of them. I'm not a political person. I don't want to be a political person. I'm just saying immigration's a big deal. And it's going to continue to be a big deal. And you're going to hear a lot more of it between now and November. It's just what it is. But here's where I'm at, folks. I can't do anything about immigration. That's not what I do. I'm, I have no power over that. I have to accept what is. And I want to take you on a little journey into the past and into the present and give us all some powerful opportunities and ideas that we can deal with in the midst of the challenges that I've just presented. First of all, I want to tell you a little bit about the past of immigration. Do you know that God's original plan for humanity was for all of us to live together in one family with one common language throughout all the earth? But then this dude named Nimrod got involved. You remember him? So Nimrod, the ruler of the Mesopotamian city of Babel, moved to gain power over all the people of the earth by building this massive tower that would draw everyone to a central location under his control. And it was man's first attempt at a one world government, which without God would have brought about almost unlimited tyranny. So God put a stop to it. He brought a stop to Nimrod's power grab simply by dividing the world's single language into many. And the workers could no longer communicate with each other, which abruptly ended tower construction. People scattered throughout the earth, grouping according to their new languages. You can read all about that in the first verses of Genesis chapter 11. While worldwide unity was God's original intent, the national separateness we experience today is a God-ordained protection against one of the worst effects of the fall, and that is man's prideful craving for power. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, listen carefully, and God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. As Paul explained, God scattered men and set the boundaries of their dwellings so that they would seek after God. God is not a globalist. God is a nationalist. God loves every nation equally. He loves our nation. He has a special place for the nation of Israel, as you know. We don't have favored status with God as Americans. God loves every nation. He has set the boundaries of every nation. And the reason he did it is because if you let someone get in charge of the whole world, you end up with what the Antichrist is going to do in the future. And he is a power broker, and all of it's over and finished. Now, having said all of that, that was God's purpose. And because of the sin of man, it got thwarted. Here's the question you have to ask. What do we do with the situation that we've been dealt? Does the Bible speak about immigration? It's in the Old Testament everywhere. And immigrants are called strangers and sojourners. We call them immigrants. God called them strangers and sojourners. The first thing he taught his people was God's people are to assist the stranger. That should be the attitude of every one of us. And that was the attitude in the Old Testament. Listen to these words. 
You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, he said, because you were a stranger once yourself in the land of Egypt. God said to his people, don't treat strangers badly. Just remember what it was like for you when you were strangers in Egypt. Make sure that you accept the strangers who come among you. After you assist a stranger, then you accept the stranger. Now, don't get lost here and don't think I'm going in the wrong direction. I'll get this all straightened out if you'll just stay with me along the way. God commanded acceptance of foreigners who were willing to adopt his laws. Leviticus says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations. Listen carefully either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. The Old Testament gives us many examples of foreign-born men and women who were accepted as citizens of Israel. In the New Testament, we do not address immigration directly, but we watch what's going on and we see Jesus Christ demonstrating attitudes of love and acceptance toward non-Israelites throughout his entire ministry. He met with a Samaritan woman, unheard of in his day. Not only did he speak to her, he engaged her in earnest conversation, and eventually he led many of her friends to faith. And then there was the famous parable of the Good Samaritan, where the Lord Jesus did the unthinkable. He made the Samaritan the hero of his story, which, I mean, that just blew the minds of everybody in that day. Jesus made no distinction. In Dr. Jeremiah's new book, Everything You Need, he invites you to consider, how would your life change if you had the energy to diligently fulfill God's purpose for you? Or the confidence to always do what pleases God? Or had an intimate knowledge of His Word? What would your faith be like if you replaced a harmful habit with a positive one? Or developed a determination that could carry you through any difficulty? Do you want to see yourself becoming more like Christ, sharing His kindness and love to those around you? It may surprise you to know that God has already given you everything you need to do all this and more. In everything you need, learn practical ways to unleash the power of God in your life and cultivate a faith that will change you and everyone around you. Yours for a gift of any amount in support of this program. Turning Point also offers three study packages, the Everything You Need Experience Pack, Study Set, and for the serious Bible student, the Comprehensive Premium Set. Plus, with any order, you'll receive the exclusive Map to Stumble Proof Living. To order or for more details, go online or call Turning Point today. Thank you for watching everything you need here on Turning Point. In appreciation of your viewership, Dr. Jeremiah would like to send you these Everything You Need Navigation Scripture cards absolutely free. Contact Turning Point today. And now, here is Dr. Jeremiah with his message the blessing. God has given you everything you need so that he can bless you in every imaginable way. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Blessing number one. Godly maturity. The first blessing is the surge of godly maturity, that, what values they should have and what opinions they should express. I've fallen in love with the word clarity. I love that word. It means seeing things as they are, not like you wish they were. It means seeing things by faith and understanding that God is working all things for his good. And the Bible has a lot to say about that that you may not remember. The psalmist said, Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things.